Good afternoon. Welcome to our panel entitled, Will Massive Open Online Courses Transform the Way We Learn? I'm Laisha Ward, President of Community Relations at Target, and on behalf of everyone at Target, which I think many of you call us, <laughs> it's our privilege to be a part of the Aspen Ideas Festival. Before I begin, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists for joining us to share their views and expertise, and you're gonna hear from them in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about massive open online courses, also known as MOOCs. As in nearly all aspects of our lives, technology is also changing the traditional model of instruction and education services. In fact, many of us just attended a conversation about the role of technology in education with Joel Klein and Walter Isaacson, which was truly an extraordinary dialogue, and this will certainly be a build on that conversation. And tomorrow at 1020, I'll moderate a panel called Bridging the Gap, the Physical and Digital Learning Space, where we'll take an in-depth look at how design thinking principles are being applied to the convergence of physical and digital spaces to improve academic achievement using a blended learning model. Created by a professor who realized he could impact more students by offering an open online course, or MOOC, that is expanding how education opportunities are being given to students all across the world. The topic isn't without controversy, though. MOOCs are massive, but often the completion rates are low. As MOOCs become widely available, it opens opportunities for students who may just want to casually explore an issue the way that one might audit a course. Others may want to earn credit for successfully mastering the material, but higher education institutions may not want to recognize the credential. MOOCs are also stirring an ongoing debate on everything from content and delivery mechanisms to the future of relevance and overall experience of the traditional classroom to the belief that over-leveraging technology will minimize the need for an effective teacher or the human curator of the learning experience, something we again talked about in the last panel with Joel and Walter. While the current focus on MOOCs is in the post-secondary education space, there are obvious implications in K-12 education, which is where Target focuses our efforts, uh, which includes giving a billion dollars back to education by the end of 2015. And we think education uh, will greatly be enhanced by having technology be a part of the solution. This conversation is not about either bricks or mortar or the digital world. It's not an either or, we think it's an and but a blended approach to improve student achievement, we think, will be the game changer because this convergence has the potential to change the way we learn and indeed to democratize education worldwide. It's our hope that MOOCs are one way, not the only way, but one way to prompt new thinking, new approaches, to providing solutions to increase high school graduation rates, to close the achievement gap that is widening for students of color and low-income students, and quite frankly, to open innovation and the best ideas for lifelong learning. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's panel, someone I admire greatly. Thank Andrea Mitchell <laughs> is NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and host of MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell Reports. She covers foreign policy, intelligence, and national security issues. She is author of Talking Back to Presidents, Dictators, and Assorted Scoundrels. Isn't that a glorious name, right? Glorious, glorious title. A memoir of her experiences covering five presidents, Congress, and foreign policy. Please welcome Andrea Mitchell. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aisha. And as you'll see from your seats, I'm also part of the Education Nation team, which is a co-sponsor of today uh, at NBC, and we have our summit in October, so I encourage all of you to join us online or in person in New York City on October 7th. But uh, it's an exciting time for us at NBC. You know, we've been at it for about four years and I have learned so much through my engagement with Education Nation and also on these panels at Aspen and in my role at the University of Pennsylvania. And I should just say that University of Pennsylvania is one of the partners, the early uh, partners in Coursera. So I was involved as a trustee in that decision and um, the professor uh, that, we've, that I've endowed uh, is teaching the uh, calculus simple, single variable course that is now one of the more popular, Rob Greist. So uh, if you're sampling online, that is 
one of my involvement. So I just want everyone to know that I have you know, some engagement with this. But here I'm in a different role as moderator. And you know, the MOOCs have so disrupted the higher education landscape in a good way. Uh, but here we're here today to talk about uh, the positive effects, the, the promise, and if you will, the peril. And we have a range of, of opinions and experiences here uh, with me. So I'm, I'm so excited that uh, first Andrew Ng, who is, of course, the founder of Coursera, the Associate Professor of Computer Science at Stanford, who can tell us how it began and how it works. Shirley Jackson, the president of Rensselaer Polytech Institute, who does not uh, encourage online education. That's not totally true. Totally true. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. New news. Something has happened. We will we get the latest it? news. <laughs> And Anand Agarwal, uh, who is the president of edX, a professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science, which is a different model than Coursera's. And so we have a, a, a healthy exchange here today. Um, Andrew, first of all, uh, just in this previous panel with Joel and Walter, I heard that MOOCs is now a verb, to MOOC up. So a word that is a somewhat awkward acronym has already become a verb. What have, we, what have you created here, and how? Yeah, w when I spoke at the um, here at same venue a year ago, one of the questions I got was, um, if we could go back and choose a different term than MOOC, what would I choose? Um, <laughs> and my answer a year ago was uh, still the same today, as I would have just called them Coursera courses. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Anna. But, <laughs> We're all about branding, but not in this session. So, so I guess this is, so the MOOC movement uh, started about two years ago. A few of us at Stanford had been working on um, online education for a few years, and this crazy thing happened. Uh, I was one of the professors that had put my class online, and 100,000 students signed up. Right? This is a huge surprise to all of us. Um, so I used to teach 400 students a year at Stanford. So you know, 100,000 students means that for me to reach a comparable size audience, I would otherwise have had to teach at Stanford for you know, 250 years. <laughs> Um, and since then, one of my friends, Daphne, and I got together to build out the technology to partner with great universities around the world. Um, among them, Stanford, Princeton, Caltech, Columbia, Penn, many others that are creating great online courses. And uh, Coursera has 3.8 million students. Since then, there have been many other organizations, one of the most prominent ones being edX, of course, that is also um, uh, joining this movement and building out their own platforms. Uh, but I think. The turning point that took place two years ago was my team created, I think, the technology that enables one professor to teach not just 100 students, but 100,000. And that really changes the economics of higher education. And I think today, um, all of us are still trying to figure out what are the implications for that. But I think it'll be great for students is the ultimate thing. And I want to ask you about this global outreach. Uh, where in an instance last September 17th, when the Pakistani government shut down the physics course, the edX physics course, uh, a Pakistani student, a young woman who was trying to complete the course, was helped by someone in Malaysia, by someone in Portugal, a, a professor in England or a student in England tried to chime in. And finally, the, the professor in Portugal downloaded and did a workaround so that she could you know, finish taking her test. I mean, this is not only diversity and globalization, but this was the kind of global community of scholars that is truly exciting. Absolutely, I think uh, if there's one uh, epiphany we've all had, it's the power of the people, the power of the crowd, the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer help. There, uh, a number of people came together to help the student or students in Pakistan, but even beyond that, then edX took the next step and we made all our videos downloadable. Um, not through YouTube, but directly off of uh, our own hosting, hosting site. So I think, uh, and it's also good for us to keep in mind that, uh, that uh, you know, all of this comes together through a number of technologies that, that came over over the past uh, you know, 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, education researchers have been working on this stuff for a while. Uh, you know, they came up with the concept of active learning in 1973. And in fact, uh, what the MOOCs have all rediscovered and I think it's important that we realize is that we've rediscovered it, uh, the concept of active learning, where you know, we interleave videos and interactive exercises to engage the student. And, and it is one thing that I think MOOCs have done is it's put, by putting technology and computing technology into education, it has made possible what education researchers have known for 50 years. 
They've known instant feedback is a good idea. They've known active learning is a good idea. They've known self-paced learning is a good idea. They've known peer-to-peer -peer learning is a good idea. And so what uh, MOOCs have done is uh, brought in computing technology to education and have made all of these things possible at a large scale. And this wasn't possible before. Let me just raise one caveat uh, in one area. At Harvard, they were working on a, uh, a technique for computer grading. And you could argue that it could work in the sciences. What about the humanities? Drew Faust said, how does a computer grade writing? How does a computer detect irony and elegance in writing? Um, Shirley? Well, let me follow on something that Anant said. You know, in fact, people are beginning to talk about not just MOOCs, but what people refer to as SPOCs, which are uh, scalable packaged online courses because of a recognition that, that there are different ways that you have to try to reach different people. Years ago, uh, Rensselaer actually was one of, an early, one of the early pioneers in what was called a studio classroom, which uh, involved this concept of interactive learning, where you wouldn't just have students sit through a boring lecture, but in fact, there were discussions uh, in the classroom preceded by work that students were expected to do outside of the class before they came. And what I think in the settings that we have, one of the greatest opportunities uh, rests with uh, using this as an engine to enrich and accelerate uh, the learning of some of the students. And in that kind of a context, it is not incompatible with the teaching of subjects in the humanities, the arts, and social sciences. In fact, it can also uh, be additive in that way. But I think we have to be, um, you know, there are a number of questions that have to be addressed, which I hope that we will get to, exactly. which really have to do with true access, um, because the way the MOOCs are presented today implies uh, a certain availability of technology, although you just described one way in a, a, a tough situation, people were able to come around that. But this whole question of broadband access, computer access at all, et cetera, that if we're going to talk about reaching underserved populations, we have to deal with that. The second is we have to define what are the learning outcomes? What do we wish to achieve vis-a-vis -vis cognition and learning? And how do we structure that uh, depending upon the different levels of preparations and even the motivations of students? Um, but I do think those provide educational questions. And I don't want to take a nonce thunder, but you know, we, as he has pointed out, and I hope he talks more about it, that we're collecting data even as these courses are being offered. And, and I think we have to try to target answers to some of these important questions as we go along. Andrew, let me pick up on the di digital divide question. The fact, I think there are 10 million uh, students, I guess K through eight, who are not don't have access to broadband in this country. Um, how do you get around that? How do you, do, do MOOCs help, as uh, some have suggested, help erase the divide between elite institutions and more populist institutions and help connect that grid? Or do they really disadvantage all of those millions of students who don't have access to broadband? You know, I think um, it, it is an issue, right? Large, many of our high schools in the United States today still do not have decent broadband access. I think it's a tragedy. And uh, the FCC is working hard with the US Department of Education to, to address that. Um, for now, we can primarily help people that do have broadband access, uh, but I think this will trickle down into not just the US, but into developing economies as well. You know, um, a few months ago, I held for the first time in my hand the Akash tablet. Um, uh, is a $40 Android tablet. Think of it as maybe like the iPad one. You know, you won't want to use it if you have the latest fancy iPad retina, whatever, but it's pretty good. And imagine being able to sell that for $40 um, and giving every child in a developing economy, every child in India, one of these. Whereas 10 years ago, if you give every child internet access, they can go online and read Wikipedia articles or something. And then, you know, that's pretty good. That's, that's actually really good. But now the world has changed. And imagine if a poor, some poor adult or a poor child in a developing economy is given internet access. And they can take themselves all the way from taking you know, a mix of causes from Coursera or, even, or from edX or from other organizations and go all the way from being 
um, barely employed to being able to make tens of thousands of dollars a year and earn a real wage for the family. We're not yet in that world, but I think in five or 10 years, I think we will be there. And uh, you've tried to apply brain research to the way you've structured edX with eight to 10 minute lectures, pauses. Explain how you've tried to build interactivity into the program. So first of all, I think, uh, uh, you know, I'll start by answering the question the following way, which is that I think MOOCs get uh, or claim uh, far too much credit. Um, I think a lot of this was done before. Uh, as an example, the, uh, so what edX did was uh, borrowed the concept of active learning where you interleave videos and interactive exercises. And in fact, in the late 90s, uh, in 98 in fact, Eric Grimson and Tomas Lozano Perez had run a class at MIT. Uh, it was an introduction to programming class where they taught with videos, of, you know, five to 10 minute videos interleaved with uh, interactive exercises. And uh, so there, uh, think of it as a Socratization of education. You, you teach by asking questions, or you teach and then you ask a question. So you, know, you get them coming or going with a question. <laughs> and so, uh, so, uh, so fundamentally, it's active learning where, where, you engage, where you engage the learner, and you make them think as you go along. And so studies have shown that five-minute you know, five videos are really good. And Sal Khan himself went through that process. And, uh, and uh, in, uh, in uh, 2007 and so on, you know, Khan-style videos became very popular, and he'd been a big inspiration to me, and uh, uh, you know, he was my, my student at MIT in the late 90s. So he had these, uh, you know, one could argue the first MOOCs where you know, he had six million uh, high school students all over the world taking, taking his Khan courses and you know, videos and interactive exercises, and he's been doing this for a long time. And he has his Khan-style videos with the really you know, uh, uh, quintessential uh, you know, Sal Khan, Tablet capture, not showing his face, but you know his handwriting. So I think a lot of so the way we learned to do this has come from experience over the past 15 years, from Grimson and Lozano Perez's experiments, from Khan style videos. So really, we brought those into edX and brought them all together into these MOOC style courses. And I think what has happened in the last uh, two years is that uh, I think the press has been very, very kind to us. They coined the term MOOC, and uh, and uh, I think uh, really popularized education. So if there's one thing that has happened in the past two years through MOOCs is that education has come front and center where you know, look at the number of people gathered here to listen about education. You know, b before two years ago, I could stand up and be screaming education all day long and there'd be two people saying, who's the nutcase out there? <laughs> so I, 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 think, I think what MOOCs have done is made education exciting and sexy. Shirley, let me just ask uh, Shirley whether the press has been too kind to MOOCs and not critical enough. Uh, do you think it's uh, less sexy than many people might think. Well, you know, I always like to uh, answer a question with a question, Andrea. <laughs> Go for it. So, so the question is, is the media known for asking the deepest questions? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you can't be serious. <laughs> and, and, and probing to the greatest depths. Um, Let's just say not all the time. <laughs> okay. But this, this is a, this is a, this is a reporter How? that has been kicked out of press conferences before for asking the really tough well, questions. Th that's, that why, that's why the three of us are here with her. And, and, and we are assorted scoundrels, by the way. So, um, speak, speak for yourself, Sharon. <laughs> I'm a good guy. <laughs> but, but let me say the following. Anand is making a very important point, which has to do with this question of what is the best presentation methodology and, and, and how much can people absorb? Now, you know, I'll, I'll play this little game, which is not really. Back in the mid-90s, Rensselaer actually got uh, big prizes from Boeing, from the Pew, uh, from, um, they got the uh, Hesburgh Prize for actual interactive learning. Not uh, using the technology to do short videos, but to actually have professors do short pieces of lectures in class. But then to use the technologies probably because we're basically an engineering and science school, to have students work together on projects in the class. What the technology has allowed is this scaling and, and this ability to try different things. And, and so when I said that we had new news, we're now uh, moving over here to edX to partner with them. You are? Yes, to on, but in a certain way. And so we're not at the point where we're saying, we're going to offer all the courses totally online. But we do think that there are some interesting ways to accelerate the learning, to reach students where they are, when they want to, 
to study and to uh, free up time in the class for very for the more important and, and deeper discussions. You're and describing so, sort of a blended experience, that's which will that's include correct. online coursework and classwork in, in, in a mix. Right. Andrew, but, yeah. but having said that, uh, let's talk a little bit more because uh, you know about what technology can or cannot enable today. There are other online collaborative tools that can be used to link students in this country to students in other countries, to work on uh, problems of common interest, whether they happen to come through a MOOCs-like co course or whether they're actually working on a project. And I happen to think that is important in terms of getting people to work together to break down barriers, to have people in any given country understand how a question or a problem, uh, a real problem that requires research or design or whatever gets uh, posed in another place. Be and so if we can use technology in that way, even as we use it to try to open uh, courses in a broader way, then I think you know, we maybe have something going on. But how you scale that you know, is, is interesting, but we do things with you know, crowdsourcing and so on today. But, but I really think this question of using it to bridge gaps is very important. Andrew, what about faculty opposition? There was a recent faculty vote at Amherst. Uh, there have been issues elsewhere where faculty really feel threatened by this, feel that it is uh, sort of an insidious way that university administrations will reduce the numbers of professors needed because you can serve so many more people online. Yeah, so you know, just to, just to ask the question at its most start, whether the Amherst was, um, I think uh, Anand was involved in that, but maybe we can speak to that later. But um, to, to put the question at its most start, will MOOCs replace professors, right? That's sort of maybe the question at the heart of it. Um, and to answer that, let me invite all of you in this audience to um, think about your, and, and, and just to make sure we're on the same page, right? This is your experience when you take a MOOC. Um, if you take, say, Robert Grice's class, Every week, you get to watch a couple hours of lecture videos with questions interspersed that you get to answer. Every week, they're usually serious homeworks that take hours to do, and you, you get them graded by uh, the computer or by other students in the class. There's an online discussion forum for students to come together to discuss the material. And if you finish the class and meet the high grading bar, um, you get a certificate at the end of it, right? So the question is, will this threaten or will this replace professors? So to answer that, um, let me actually invite all of you in the audience now to think back on your college experience and think back on who was your favorite professor. Maybe you had a professor that you had amazing conversations with. Maybe someone that gave you great advice that maybe even changed your life. Um, I'm thinking about my mentors, uh, you know, Professor Andrew Moore, Professor Michael Kearns, that to this day, I'm incredibly grateful to them for their advice. And to this day, I'm actually genuinely mystified why they were so patient with the you know, 18 year old and frankly, very naive uh, uh, 18 year old version of me and, and, and gave me so much advice. So as you think about your favorite professor from when you were in college, let me ask you, can we replace him or her with a computer? And the answer is so obviously no. Um, it would be, would be silly to even try. I think the reality, though, is that that favorite professor of yours today is spending a lot of his or her time in content preparation, uh, preparing to walk into the classroom to deliver the same lecture year after year. They're spending a lot of time manually grading homeworks year after year. I think the opportunity for technology is to free up that favorite professor of yours from a lot of this repetitive work so that they have much more time to have more of those amazing conversations that they had with you, but with students in the future. And I think this is very much the um, RPI vision as well. And uh, let's talk about the possibility of monetizing this, the for-profit versus non-profit mode, and how sustainable can the non-profit mode be uh, long-term? So, uh, you know, edX is a non-profit, and we've also made our platform uh, open source, which means not only are our courses free, but we, we've also given away on June 1st our entire software. So anybody can take our software for free and, and set up a competitor to, competitor to do edX if you want. You know, here, take it, go ahead and do it. And, and, and it goes to our mission of really wanting to educate people around the world and improve the quality of education. But that said, at the end of the day, we want to be self-sustaining. You know, we are nonprofit. Nonprofit doesn't mean being an endless black hole where you pour money in and it vanishes. 
So we have to be self-sustaining in that, in that at the end of the day, we don't want to be beholden to somebody else. We need to be able to produce enough uh, revenue to be able to sustain our own operations. We're not looking to have a $100 billion IPO or be the next Facebook. We just want to be you know, uh, pretty reasonably self-sustaining, which is a much less challenging task. So we're looking for a number of ways of, uh, of uh, uh, generating revenue in ways that are still completely consistent with our mission, which is increase access to education, improve campus education, and do research. So one example, and there, you know, we are revenue positive, not cash flow positive, revenue positive. Uh, re revenue positive means you have some revenue. <laughs> which is not charity or a gift, so uh, you earned it. And so, uh, so uh, we're looking at a number of approaches, and we're doing some of these pilots uh, to try to figure out what is working, what is not working. As one example, we made an announcement uh, with uh, the International Monetary Fund. They liked that X platform. They liked uh, uh, the quality of our courses. So they're working with us, and they have asked edX to work with them. And edX is going to host a private platform, a hosted private site for IMF. And they're going to put up, create all their courses, uh, two or three courses for now, uh, and going to hundreds of courses over the next year or two, and their clientele are governments and, and, and uh, practitioners all over the world. And so there, you know, they are going to give edX revenue in, for consulting and for hosting the platform for them and things like that. So a number of su such organizations have approached edX. So that's one model where we can try to sustain ourselves. Another model is Spox. Um, different people have called it different things. Uh, a scalable... Uh, 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 scalable package. I like we that better. We are in a, a strange uh, the, the new that, uh, world of acronyms yeah, here. The, the one that uh, <laughs> uh, Armando Fox coined, uh, Professor Berkeley, Spock, was small private online course. So we licensed these small courses to campuses or corporations or NGOs where uh, they use these courses as sort of the next generation textbook in a blended model on campus. And we've done this with San Jose State. And in the fall, the entire California State University system will be licensing edX courses for use on their campuses as, think of it as the next generation textbook, where rather than having this paper, the book that you buy for 100 bucks, here you get an entire course. And the professor can then decide, do they want to use the videos? Or the professor wants to give uh, the diehard lecture people, sure, go give a lecture, just use the assessments from the online course. So you can, they can mix and match and use what they want, and they're uh, edX gets a fee for each of these licensed courses, much like you would pay for a, uh, uh, pay for a textbook. So that's the second model. Uh, yeah, well, now, Andrew, you may, perhaps you can explain the for-profit model and how you see that working, the monetizing of that. Um, sure. So let's see. Uh, uh, Coursera, as a social entrepreneurship that is a for-profit company, has to also be sustainable. I have to say, I, give, I think Anand is actually much better than I am in making money. Um, I think he's monetized most of a university. Uh, most of Alex's partners signed up sometimes for free, sometimes up to paying five million dollars, and you charge them fifty thousand dollars to create a course or something. So I, do, I, I, I give Anand. Oh, okay. Data. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, but let me let me let me describe Coursera as a monetization model. Um, so uh, uh, we offer at no cost our university partners the platform services, support, and so on. So we need to find a different way to bring in revenue, um, uh, and so. One of our programs has been um, to offer the course for free. That's important to us for the mission and philosophical reasons. But for a modest fee, say $50, we do some work to verify your identity. You know, so we check your ID at the start of the class, make sure that you really exist as a person. Um, every time you submit a homework, we use a combination of taking your picture via your webcam and um, using your typing rhythm. So it turns out that the way you type on your keyboard is unique to you. It's like a fingerprint. And by measuring the rate at which you type, we know if it's really you sitting your keyboard. <coughs> and so by asking for your typing rhythm and a webcam picture, we can verify that it really is you sitting at your keyboard doing the homework. Um, and based on that, we issue a verified certificate issued by our university partner, you know, Duke, Johns Hopkins, whatever, and Coursera that, uh, uh, that you can put on your resume. Um, and so we have brought in not quite a million dollars yet. We just started uh, uh, bringing revenue this way starting in January. Um, although again, kind of as a philosophy of Coursera, within the organization, as we're rolling this out, you know, like $50 for a certificate, a verified certificate for Duke, from Duke University sounds cheap, but then um, to the neediest in our society, I think uh, $50 is an unthinkable amount of money to the people, some of the people they would most like to serve. So one of the things I'm quite proud of is also that we rolled out a financial aid program uh, so that if someone you know, would really benefit from one of these courses but doesn't even have a credit card, say, we ask them to fill out a one-page financial aid application and uh, we give it to them for free. 
walking around Silicon Valley, I've been told many, many times now that this is a totally abnormal thing for a company to do. Uh, but, but with um, us, with me, my co-founder Daphne, also a professor running Coursera, we felt like, you know, if you want to be an education company, um, we, we felt very strongly that this is the only way to do it. Can I just add, um, add to clarify, this is a certificate. It's not a, in any way course credit or a degree. Mm -hmm. And the certificates would have to be accepted by another transfer university. So far, that hasn't happened to my knowledge. Uh, it's envisioned that it could be, for instance, uh, accepted at some point as an AP course, but that's down the road. Yeah, so actually, to, to, to my surprise, um, uh, there have been universities, so we had nothing to do with this, but there have been quite a few universities sending their students to take MOOCs and offering their students academic credit for, for our courses. Um, this was one of the reasons why we recently announced partnerships with uh, 10 large state university systems here in the United States. Among them, you know, SUNY, which has half a million students, Tennessee, uh, U University System of Georgia. Um, together, these university systems enroll one and a quarter million students. I think that MOOCs, for the most part, what we've done, what all of us have done a great job is transforming um, continuing education, where for many working adults, you know, I guess the old model of education, where you go to college for four years, and then the next 40 years coast on what you learn in college, <laughs> that makes no sense in today's rapidly changing world, and all of us need regular booster shots of knowledge. So the convenience of online classes, so where, where, where you don't need to hire a babysitter twice a week, where you're taking classes from the best universities, you know, not necessarily the local community college, which has its own strengths as well, that has brought a lot of working adults back into the education system. That will continue to grow. Looking forward, I think there is also a huge need to raise quality, maybe lower costs at our university campuses to help more students get degrees. And so with this uh, blended learning mix of online content together with these often, frankly, really amazing human instructors, uh, we're working with these 10 large state university systems to try to offer you know, this quality of education to some of their one and a quarter million students to try to hopefully move the needle on um, college completion, on, on college well, success. Let, let me talk for a moment because I think it is important. I mean, I'm a president of a university and, and, and there's a way that some of this has evolved which is a little different uh, d across the, the campuses where if the administration makes a decision, that's different than if the fa whether the faculty will buy into uh, that decision. But in a certain sense, that's why I actually think that open platforms are important because th it gives the, they give the opportunity for, uh, to, to have the faculty engaged and to let them be part of what gets created. And in our case, we actually have a center called the Rensselaer Center for Open Software, which actually is funded by uh, the generosity of one of our alums. And so the students actually get to, to, uh, to play. And, and, and they actually then are part of what we're doing to develop a sequence of pre-collegiate courses because we think uh, they know a lot about what it means when they come into the university. Let me what ask you, but let me pick up on that, Shirley, because okay. in, when I talk to CEOs who tell me that they are not finding graduates, high school or even college graduates, that fit their technical needs and that right. there's this big gap, do you see a role for this kind of online education to fill that gap, to uh, help prepare high school students better, to matriculate into college so that they don't fail? including uh, young people from rural or inner city communities that haven't had the advantages of some of the, the better school right. systems? The answer is yes. But I also think that, that there's an interesting and unique opportunity, and, and, and in a sense it, it's a takeoff from this work with the, uh, the IMF, uh, for uh, colleges and universities to partner with companies in terms of what is it that they need in terms of training, and that training can be targeted at a pre-collegiate or, let's say, non-collegiate level, as well as for professional education. And so I think we've got to kind of be able to sort through the difference between uh, flipping a classroom and having no classroom. And for 
what categories of students are the differences uh, best targeted? The difference between specific knowledge acquisition and the broader college experience that many young people and their parents seek and, and go through. And then the questions about access and authentication and so forth uh, against some backdrop that, that has to create a sustainable uh, economic model. If we totally disrupted the current model, then you have to ask where does the content come from and how do we uh, certify that, that content. But let me say one other thing about open platforms, and that's why we're sort of moving and have moved, actually, to, uh, to work with edX. And that has to do with the following. A lot of the discussion around MOOCs talks about having videos and YouTube videos, online exercises, interactive exercises, uh, software tutors, uh, and so on. And all those things are very important. But the real question becomes, where is human intervention important? Uh, also, depending upon what you're teaching, it's different when you're trying to teach a, a, a calculus course or a circuits course or a computer science course than teaching a physics course or chemistry course and so forth. And so for us, we actually have a unique platform ourselves at the university. It's called the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center. And it actually has the kind of production and post-production capability that Disney could use. And so I actually believe that what that allows for us with working with an open platform is to go beyond what the MOOCs traditionally do. And those, that going beyond and creating even digital uh, and augmented reality experiences, but ones that then one puts into a media form, turns out to be important depending upon what one wants to teach. And so, so I'm pretty excited about this broader use of technology, and I would like to see us open the aperture more about what we're actually talking about in terms of the use of technology and not be so narrow about segmented YouTube videos and online software, uh, tutor-based exercises, to think about these broader uses. But in order to do it, we've really got to have the serious conversations about <laughs> learning outcomes, to whom we're targeting this, at what levels, and then I think we can have the technology well, do a heck of a lot for well, us. Well, speaking about uh, outcomes, and let me ask you uh, and on, about the reports of dropout rates as high as 90%. So first of all, you know, the uh, uh, researchers in education have suggested that uh, um, we use the phrase stop out as opposed to drop out. Because the phenomenon in MOOCs is very different from universities. In universities, uh, people get admitted, they pay tuition or whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, queen's ransoms and so on, you know, get admitted. And, and there it's, it's drop out. But with MOOCs, it's stop out because there's, there's nothing. You know, you, you signing up, you know, you go on to edX or Coursera or Udacity or whatever, it takes you five seconds to sign up and, and take a course. And a lot of curiosity seekers, you know, thrill seekers, and so it's, it's stop out. And so, so, so the numbers there, uh, you're right in that, of the people that sign up, so, uh, you know, for the first course that we taught on edX uh, was a course that uh, my colleagues and I taught on circuits and electronics. And we had, uh, about a year and a half ago, 155,000 students from uh, 162 countries took the course. Now, that's 155,000. But 7,200 students uh, completed the course uh, successfully. And this was a MIT hard course, very challenging. Really impressive that 7,200 completed, 5%. So we said 5%, that's a terrible number. You know, uh, that, that was a stopout rate of 95%. However, I want you to put this in the following context. How did, so at MIT, let's say the, the, uh, the pass rate is 99% or 98%, whatever, whatever uh, it is. How did we get there? So 20,000 students apply to MIT each year. Of that 20,000 students, we admit about 6, 7% of students. And then of those 6, 7% 6, of students, uh, 98 or 99% uh, take the course and, and, and they pass the course. So from the base of number of students who apply, to students who pass this course, you're talking about five, six, seven percent. Now look at the edX course. We are democratizing education. You know, your income, whether your parents could pay for SATs or training to get admitted to colleges, none of that matters. 
Anybody can come and take a course. It's the ultimate democratizer of education. We have completely flipped the funnel. So anybody can come in. 155,000 people came in to, to take the course. Some people did the videos. Some people didn't bother to do the exercises. Everybody learned something or the other. Some people just didn't care. But towards the end, 5% got a certificate. So you tell me, which system is better? Both, in both cases, it's 5 to 6%. Okay, in one case, we've completely democratized education. Everybody could come and do it. But in one case, we completely you know, had a funnel where we admitted only 1,500 students. What about the remaining 18,500 students? They had no chance. They didn't even have a shot at it. They didn't even see you know, the interior of the dorm rooms at, at the campus. Here, you know, they got to see the courses. They got to do the videos. And many students who, who stopped out, they took the same course in the fall. They took Khan videos in the summer you know, uh, honed up on mathematics, and then it took the course again, and again, and, and at the end of the day, if you can cut it, if you can master the material, age no bar, you know, preparation no bar, we'll give you a certificate. So you tell me which is better. Well, let me ask you a question if I can. What, is the, what are the demographics of the people in the end, in terms of their educational levels, et cetera, who signed up for the course in the first place? So, so we have all those, we have all that data. Uh, the demographics of the people, uh, we took a survey towards the end of the course, in the last week of the course, and uh, the demo for, the, for, for that particular course, the demographics were as follows. 5% of the students were uh, high schoolers, 18 and under. 45% of the students were college age, 18 to 25. And 50% of the students were 25 years and older. So that was the uh, demographic uh, for, that, for that course. Andrew, I wanted to ask you um, about, you come from a STEM background, uh, so does everyone here actually, with the exception of me. Uh, what about the humanities? How, do, how does it work? Does it work well for those of us who study music and art and literature, uh, as well as the calculus and physics and engineering courses? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So, you know, uh, tell, you, tell you a story. Um, uh, we launched the first few moves, developed all this multiple choice, randomized multiple choice. We're really proud of some of the technology we, we built, you know. And so, um, tell you a story. About a year ago, I was visiting the University of Pennsylvania, and I learned an interesting lesson. Um, I learned that if you go to a poetry professor, we actually did this, and if you show this poetry professor your, you know, shiny new multiple choice auto grading technology, and you try to convince this poetry professor to teach his class using just multiple choice, I learned that he will invite you to exit his office. <laughs> um, I know exactly who you mean. I <laughs> um, but I think uh, to, to, to Andrea's point, I think humanities are very important. So one of the innovations that I'm most proud of is um, a system that we call peer grading because in many of the humanities, we need to ask students to do more open-ended exercises, such as write an essay or write a, or write a poem. Um, and so how do you grade 100,000 essays? One professor can't grade 100,000 essays. But what you can do is get the students to grade each other's essays. We actually developed a fairly sophisticated system for doing that, where as a student, you would be asked to first do the work, and then we actually train you on how to grade. Um, after that, we ask you to demonstrate proficiency in grading. So grade a few pieces of work where we know what the, that the instructor has also graded and show us that you can give accurate grades similar to what the instructor had graded. And then finally, every student is required to grade, say, five other students' pieces of work. And in exchange, you get feedback from five other students about the quality of your own work. Um, so by doing this at scale, our partners and us have been able to use the data to study whether peer grading at scale in classes of hundreds of thousands of students works. And um, I think the conclusions of the studies done by, you know, by Princeton, by Stanford, by our various partners and by us is that peer grading gives fairly accurate grades and very useful qualitative feedback. Uh, because when you have five other students commenting on your work, it turns out sometimes there's one student that's not non-native speaker of English. That's the biggest problem. Non-native speakers of English tend to give less useful qualitative comments. But, but when you have four, four or five students comment on your work, um, that's actually, you know, very, very useful feedback. And as a student, you get to play the role of a teacher as well. You get to see other students' work. 
So one thing that really surprised me, though, was initially we wrote this out with you know, poetry class, a history class, a few courses like that. One thing that really surprised me was the creativity that our instructors then went to um, apply to, to peer grading. Um, one example, there was a design class at Penn where the instructor had students build physical artifacts, like go out and take pieces of wood and saw them and nail them together or something. I, I don't actually know. Um, but the students then built these really beautiful things, and they took their cell phone cameras, took pictures, and uploaded you know, this like, furniture design thing to the website to be graded by other students. I thought that was amazing. Here's another one. Um, we chatted about, shared each other a little bit about K-12 education. One of the ways for us to move the needle on K-12 education, in my opinion, is to work on teacher professional development. I think in this country, we offer you know, K-12 teachers um, far too few resources, far too few resources to, for, to develop themselves. And, and there's a huge mess that I can talk about too. But um, some of our partners have been putting online courses to help train teachers because I think that's the best way to get that seven-year-old kid, the seven-year-old kid that has not yet learned to sit still for two hours to take a MOOC. I think when we get that seven-year-old kid a better teacher, we can transform their education. So how does this use peer grading? We now have teachers um, learning new teaching skills and modeling out, say, classroom management. Um, and demonstrating a classroom management skill in front of their webcam and videotaping themselves saying, this is how I would call on students. And you upload a video of yourself practicing these classroom skills to the website so that you can be then peer graded and get feedback from other teachers. So it's been amazing to develop this technology and, and I'm proud that it's what allowed us to open up MOOCs to the humanities, to the social sciences, basic sciences, medicine, business, law, finance. It really broadened out. This, this thing we, I'm really proud we came up with really broadened MOOCs beyond the, the science In and fact, engineering. I learned that one of, one of your students, one of the students of the writing class or a poetry class is Dick Durbin who somehow finds time while being a senator to take the class. I wanted to open it up to our wonderful audience. There are floating microphones. So um, please jump in and, yes, right here. You, you want to wait for the mic, which is on its way? Thank you, and then I'll go back. Um, could you expand a little bit on the, uh, the uh, ability of, of students online to work with each other, not necessarily in the grading scenario, but how uh, teaching is such a, uh, in this environment is kind of a lonely exercise and how you found the ability in these large dispersed classrooms to put people together in groups or, or in pairs or whatever, or to sign up together to push each other to actually get through the, the okay. coursework. Good sure, question. I think, uh, At I edX, think you're already doing that. Sure, I think one of the, uh, all MOOCs are doing that actually. It's, uh, I think one of the biggest successes of MOOCs, and certainly for me, uh, it was this epiphany where the real reason we are able to scale to uh, millions of students is that the students are working with each other. I'll tell you a story. When uh, we launched our first course with 155,000 students, I tell my staff, all right, everybody, 7 by 24, no sleep, no nothing, we're going to answer questions on the discussion forum. 150,000 students, what do you expect? So at 2 a.m. at night, I'm sitting down, uh, you know, a student from Pakistan asks a question. And I'm not a fast typist. You know, I'm not in the millennial generation, despite my youthful looks. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so uh, so, so I'm, 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 I don't type all that fast, so, so I'm typing out there. And before I could finish typing, oh, in pops an answer from, I think, a student from Egypt. Oh, here's, I think here's the answer. It's not quite the right answer. I'm trying to fix the answer. And before I know it, I'm sort of sitting there watching, fascinated. From the US, from New Zealand, from Colombia, from India, students are popping back and forth with answers and discussing it. And by four o'clock in the morning, they figured out the answer. And all I had to do was go in and say, good answer. <laughs> yeah. And so, so this was a huge scaling yeah. Which exercise. Which does not right. require a whole lot of typing. Yeah, but and, and, and right. exactly. Right. And, and, students, right. and students are telling us, a student from El Salvador, that he tells us that, uh, that uh, he learned best by teaching. Yeah, I, I think that's true, but, but, but Anand, let's, let's kind of look at the other side. You know, the, 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 at the MIT uh, Teaching and Learning Laboratory, uh, they actually looked at some of the data from, from this course and uh, discovered that um, even though you had a number of students online, only about 10% uh, of the students actively participated in the online forum. As well that those, you know, who actually did uh, work groups offline and worked with tutors or teachers offline did somewhat better than those who purely did online. Although, you know, there were differences in terms of how much students use videos for homework 
versus what was on the online, posted in the online forum for exams. And so I think the real thing is rather than sell, 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 we need to ask, ask, ask. Say that we have a great technology that you know, it, it allows certain things, but wow, let's step back as educators, not as technologists, and say, what are the questions we have to ask about cognition and learning? And how do we optimize the use of the technology to get at answers to those questions? So that in the end, the sum is greater, than, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Very you know, I, I think we need to do that. I just want to bring in another question. There's a woman there near the, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Wendy Woon from the Museum of Modern Art. Um, we've been running some online art making and art history classes, and we're going to be one of your first K-12 classes. One of the things we were really surprised about was finding that the people who took classes formed their own communities afterwards and have continued right. relationships, met around the world, uh, do things together, um, continue to learn together. Have you seen that in any of your courses? Uh, yes. So. Um, Boy, so all around the world, there's students forming meetups. Uh, they're all around the world, there's students forming meetups, uh, coming together every week to study MOOCs. Let me, let me share with you one of the experiences I had. So I happened to be visiting uh, Beijing a few months ago, and I actually visited a student meetup there. And so it was me and like, you know, 20, 20 students sitting in the library just chatting. It was amazing because um, sitting here in the US, all of us in this room, frankly, I think are somewhat privileged to have had access to a great education. When I met some of those students in Beijing, and frankly, they're a lot better off than a lot of others in China, there was such a hunger for knowledge. Um, imagine if you live in a city and you have a day job doing the same thing day in, day out, and you want to learn something new, and you just don't have any way to find out what's the latest in you know, computer science or poetry or um, or, or, or medicine, or chemistry, or law. I, I was amazed at the hunger of knowledge. And, and, and just, and also, you know, I gave a talk at, uh, in, in Beijing, and it really shocked me. I'm, I'm not that, I'm like, I'm like a normal, you know, I'm like a normal person. But there were people taking train rides to come, they're taking train rides for hours to come and listen to me talk. And I, I don't think I gave a pretty good talk, but talking to some of them, I, it made me finally understand, really imagine if you didn't have access to all the resources that you had, and suddenly you get allowed to take a free UPenn class or Columbia class. It, it, it changes the lives well, of so well, many people. Well, what are we doing in Africa? You know, what are we doing uh, in a barrio in LA? I mean, in the end, if you really want to talk about universal access, you know, we have to get to that. Can we, can we talk about that a bit in terms of what the techniques would be to, you know, to make think, a difference uh, in, you know, in I, that I think arena. you make a really good point about uh, access, but even in Africa, I think we can still do quite a bit there. As, uh, as one example, you know, we, have, we do have 85,000 students in Africa, and, uh, and the stories are just absolutely staggering. The, uh, yeah, the number of students there, uh, and they want to use, uh, they're talking to edX about you know, how can we uh, bring more online technology. They have a huge skills gap and they want to think about, uh, they don't have enough resources and faculty to teach, uh, to create more universities. And, right. uh, and uh, they're looking to see how they can bring in online technology uh, uh, to improve uh, what they have. And we had a poet, there was a poverty course by Esther Duflo, hugely popular in Africa. Students writing us and telling us, uh, now we understand why we are in this you know, cycle. So, so I think, where focus should be is to develop uh, mobile yeah. uh, apps to Absolutely. actually do that. Absolutely. That's how you can begin Absolutely. to make a penetration in, in that regard. We have probably time for one more question, I think, one or two short questions. Hi, thank you all for coming today. The first big, big, big speaker yesterday on, the new, on big ideas uh, was a lady from Ernst & Young, and she, she made a point of, of saying, that female leaders, uh, were in the, especially in the C-suite, had, had, had found in their studies, had learned from the on-campus on, on activities that were not related to the classroom. They were athletes or they were involved in non-classroom ideas. And I'm wondering how that fits with the MOOC model and what that's, what, what, how do we preserve that, her great idea and her point? Well, I think well let, me, let me, can I speak very quickly to that? It's not just for women. 
is for men. And when I talked about the difference between sort of getting certain knowledge and certain things into people's heads versus the broader experience, what we find is that if we want to turn out the citizens we want people to be, not just people who know a lot and are smart, that there are a whole lot of other things that go into educating that person. And we have brilliant students who come to us uh, when they come, but they, got a, they have a lot of other things <laughs> they're dealing with and that we then have to deal with with them so that by the time they graduate, uh, you know, they're going to be the leaders we are hoping that we're educating them to be. Well, I would just respond also that I think the consensus here would be that this is supplemental. It is a blended experience. It is not expected to replace the campus experience, but it is hoped uh, for to be a supplement or also a, a way to bridge a gap for those who can't afford access to the campus experience. I don't know if I speak if I, I, speak for I, think, I think it's important. I think it's important to keep in mind that the two populations we serve. One is the hundreds of thousands of students out there that otherwise would never have access to our campuses. Previously, they had nothing, and now we give them a much higher quality experience. The second population are the students attending the Stanford's, the Princeton's, the MIT's, um, all the SUNY's and the University System of Georgia's. And for them, by implementing blending learning, we can also give them a better experience. Is there time for one more quick question right here, sir? Oh, okay, sorry. So this is such an interesting conversation on access to education uh, and bridge the gap. Has there been any thought or efforts to make this available in the United States, not Africa, not Beijing, to people who are incarcerated. So for example, we have a mass incarceration in this country of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young people who will re-enter the community, most of them high school dropouts. So has there been a thought while they are detained of using this as a way to provide education, especially since in states and in federal correctional facilities, funding has made the courses otherwise well, available. Good question. I, I know from personal example that states like Vermont require education, and there is a very uh, extensive education in the Vermont state prisons at the college level. Uh, but uh, no, I've seen, uh, and one can imagine that. Uh, again, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> But, but, but clearly, you know, if you're incarcerated and you don't have access to teachers and schools and uh, people won't let you near their children, then, you know, but, you know what better way than, uh, than sit next to a computer uh, and, and take courses? But I do have an example where, uh, so MIT's open courseware was in some sense a precursor to all of this. Uh, so 10 years ago, MIT put all of its courses online, entire courses completely online through OCW. And I remember six or seven years ago receiving a letter from, uh, from an inmate from, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I think it was Sing Sing, saying that, thank you very much, Professor Agrawal, you've changed my life. And I'm wondering, what did I do now? <laughs> and, 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 and I read it, it was a really nice card. He had hand-drawn the card. And inside he said, you know, I took your uh, circuits course on open courseware and took the entire course, you know, being in prison. And uh, I really want to come out and become an electrical engineer. So, you know, uh, so there is an example from the precursor of MOOCs, you know, the open courseware systems that uh, inmates can make use of the, these resources to, uh, to, better, uh, to better their future. I'm afraid our time is up. We thank all of you, this wonderful audience. Thanks to Anna, Shirley, and Andrew. Conversation.